When we're referring to fixed restorations, and also when we're referring to uh, dental ceramic systems, we always referring at the type of uh, substructure that it's used to support the ceramic restorations. So for instance, <clears throat> if we have all ceramic restoration, we can use uh, substructures that are made of silica ceramics, um, glass infiltrated or oxide ceramics. Um, all ceramics restoration can be done either the traditional or analog method, well, or we can use the, the CAD CAM um, or digital method. When we're talking about metal ceramic systems or porcelain fused to metal, um, there are different type of restorations uh, that they can be done. Um, just the difference between all ceramic and metal ceramic is the substructure. So the all ceramic has a substructure that is tooth-like um, shade and the metallic uh, ceramics, they use a metal substructure or a framework and then uh, porcelain is applied on both of them. Um, so both of them, they can be fabricated using the analog me method and also um, there are different type of uh, layering porcelain depending on the substructure that we're using. So for all ceramic uh, type of restoration, if we're using the traditional dental ceramics, we can have silica-based ceramics. For glass ceramics or glass infiltrated ceramics, we can use lucid in, or reinforced felspatic ceramics. Lithium desilicate uh, ceramics, these are the pressable ceramics, or floor mix glass ceramics. Uh, also, in terms of the strength, um, usually the substructure, regardless if it's all ceramic um, material or porcelain uh, fused to metal, so the metal substructure or the uh, all ceramic substructure has to be stronger than the applied porcelain or the layering porcelain. And again, um, the substructure could be glass infiltrated uh, ceramic, uh, metal oxide based ceramic, alumina based ceramic, or zirconia based ceramic. So in this presentation, we're going to concentrate more on the differences between um, pressed ceramics and uh, porcelain fused to metal um, uh, uh, restorations. So in order for um, have a successful type of restoration, both preparations, either for porcelain fused to metal or for all ceramics, they have to have a certain design. And this is the doctor's um, clinical aspect. So the way they prepare the, the tooth to receive the final restoration, it's very important because there are certain requirements in terms of uh, either we're going to have a all ceramic restoration or a porcelain fused to metal restoration. In general, for um, all ceramic restoration, we want a margin that it's either a shoulder or a chamfer uh, because usually the ceramic restorations are um, strong, but also they're glass like materials, so they might be a little brittle. Um, and if we apply any other type of uh, margin, like a knife edge or a bevel, that means that the um, ceramic is very thin by the margin. And the ceramics being a very uh, brittle material might break at the margin. So for <clears throat> all ceramics, the margin, it's uh, desired to be either a chamfer or a shoulder to give more support for the restoration. Um, on the other hand, for the porcelain fused to metal restoration, if <clears throat> let's say the patient has a cavity that's uh, under the gum, uh, subgingival, the doctor might uh, require to uh, make a deeper uh, preparation and therefore put the margin subgingival. Now, when the margin is subgingival under the gum, it's very difficult to have a chamfer or a shoulder. It's not 
<laughs> indicated to have a, sh a shoulder or a chamfer margin. Therefore, in those cases for porcelain fused to metal, a dentist may decide to do either a knife edge or um, bevel margin because that allows the gum to um, grow around the restoration and not to shrink. If we put um, a shoulder or a chamfer margin under the gum, the gum in that area, it's going to reserve, it's going to shrink. So we want to maintain the integrity of uh, the gum. Uh, another important aspect, especially for all ceramic restoration, is to provide uniform stress distribution without having any points of concentration of stress. So what that implies, for instance, when the doctor prepares the restoration, there should be no sharp edges. Uh, everything should be rounded, no undercuts. Uh, undercuts provide um, opening, especially when it comes close to the margin. Uh, it's very hard to close that margin. Uh, so the preparation has to be um, flat and avoid any undercuts. Um, also, the preparation should be smooth and not present any um, differences in the in the surface of, of the preparation because that's also increase the way the pores uh, that when the patient bites down, it's transferred to the restoration. Um, crowns in general require a reduction of 1.5 millimeter on the axial walls and 1.5 to 2 millimeter on the occlusal or incisal surfaces. So again, this is a requirement just to um, allow to have a final restoration that's inserted in the patient's mouth and it's long lasting. Um, if the restoration thickness, it's lower than the required thickness, the 1.5 to 2 millimeter, what happens if the patient bites down hard, it might break that restoration. So these are the specifications that usually the manufacturers um, recommend when um, they develop different type of materials, dental materials. When they told the dentist, if we're using this material, we have to make sure that there is enough clearance from the mesial, distal, uh, and also occlusal um, uh, contact so the restoration has enough material in there to withstand the patient's bite force. Okay. Also, the margin is prepared as a 0 0.5, 0 0.6 to 1. millimeter shoulder with a rounded axial shoulder line angle. So, what that means is that the shoulder porcelain, the shoulder margin, it's a little bit uh, uh, wider because that allows for the margin to, of the restoration to be um, stronger. Uh, margin with shoulders greater than 100 to 110 degree bevels or knife edge should not be put on this type of restoration. Also, veneers should have a uniform reduction of 0 0.6 to 1 millimeter with a chamfer at the gingival margin. So again, when we're talking about uh, veneers and laminates in general, those are thin facings that are done to, um, for aesthetic purposes. Uh, and the reduction of the natural tooth should be minimum, especially if there are healthy teeth, but also we have to have a certain requirements of thickness for our restoration to be strong. In Saram, it's a registered trademark of uh, Vida Zan Fabric, Bad Sagan, uh, Germany, and it provides a ceramic technique for producing high strength all porcelain crowns and three unit uh, anterior um, fixed uh, partial dentures. So, <clears throat> in this type of um, all ceramic system, it's using alumina, which is a glass infiltrated aluminum oxide ceramic substructure where uh, we use that and then we're going to build up um, the crown using a layering porcelain. So the coping, it's made of aluminum oxide or alumina, 
which is strong. And also uh, one advantage of Illumina is that it can be colored in the tooth shade. So unlike the metal um, substructure, which is grayish, or it could be um, gold in color, depending on the dental alloy that we use, that metal has to be black with opaque using an all ceramic type of um, substructure that allows us to better uh, match the patient's shade because the substructure itself could be the same shade as the patient uh, natural dentition. Um, so in order for us to start working on a case, the first thing we have to do is to pour up the impression, first inspect the impression. If there are any voids, or any disruptions into the margins, then we have to call the dentist and let them know that the impression is not very good. Maybe they would like to call the patients back and take another impression. So once we have the impression, it's correct, everything looks fine, we can disinfect the impression, put up the impression and fabricate the uh, master cast. Then once the master cast is done, we can trim it, uh, pour the opposing arch or the opposing cast, and then we're going to mount the case using either a face bow or a bite registration. Usually for um, big cases, it's recommended to use a semi-adjustable articulator, not only because it's more accurate, but also because we can do different type of movement of the patient's uh, jaw. So not only we can do the up and down movement, but also the lateral movement, which is very important. So once we have the case mounted, now we can concentrate on um, fabricating the dies. We can cut the dies and then we can ditch them, ditching meaning removing the XX stone, and then we can uh, and expose the margin. Once we have the margin exposed, we can mark the margin, apply the dye hardener, which seals the surface of the uh, stone and make the preparation a little bit stronger, the dye a little bit stronger. And then we, we can apply a layer or um, two layers, depending on the case, of um, space um, material and the uh, the purpose of the spacer is to create a little room between the preparation and the crown for the cement. So very important when we have a preparation and that's um, sometimes we have to keep this in mind, how the doctor does the preparation, it always, always depends on the extent of the cavity. Sometimes the doctor can do a nice ideal preparation and sometimes because the cavity might be a little too deep or too extensive, uh, then uh, the preparation can be a little different in shape. So um, if there are any undercuts in the preparation, we have to block those undercuts and then <clears throat> um, we can apply the dye spacer. So undercuts are undesirable when we're talking about preparation, especially when uh, undercuts are close to the margin. Um, if the treatment plan for, uh, calls for a construction or, of a fixed prosthodontic, uh, free, fixed partial denture, a wax prop on the dentalist ridge to provide the support for building up the panting during the last steps. So in other words, what they're talking about here, when we have a bridge and we have to do a pontic, right? Sometimes we can buy those uh, prefabricated wax patterns. So we can um, customize those patterns to wax it up to um, what we need in terms of fabricating the framework. Um, also, the connectors between, when we're talking about a bridge, the connector between each unit has to be designed in such a way to provide adequate um, strength of the bridge. So um, there are certain requirements when we're talking about porcelain fused to metal 
and all ceramic restoration bridges. When the connection for um, each unit, when we're using a metal substructure, that connection, because the metal, it's a little bit stronger and also is not so brittle, that connection could be made a little bit thinner um, and allowing for more aesthetics. For all ceramics, the connection has to be really broad and really strong, a little bit thicker. And sometimes, you know, that can um, give us a little bit of um, headaches in terms of uh, aesthetics. So to compensate for that, usually what a good technician will do will make the connection between each unit of the bridge stronger on the lingual and um, a little more aesthetic on the facial or, or the buckle. So the, each individual tooth of the bridge looks like individual tooth and not like a big block of porcelain. So there are certain um, design aspects that we can take care of it and also um, maintain the requirements of um, what the, the manufacturer recommended for using different systems for substructure, okay? Um, for in ceram system, this system requires the duplication of the model and dies using a refractory material and build up the layering alumina powder. It's mixed with a special liquid to build up the coping or framework directly into the refractory cast. So in other words, there is a special type of material, it's called the refractory material that can withstand, it's kind of like, um, if you think about it, a cross between dry stone and investment to give you a better idea. So what's the advantage of using this type of material? is because we can build up directly, we can put porcelain directly on the die. We don't have to put any uh, substructure underneath or anything underneath, just build up porcelain on top of um, the model of, of the die. And that um, refractory model can be put in the porcelain oven to bake the porcelain and nothing is gonna happen to the refractory model. The, this type of model, it's considered one of the most accurate models because it doesn't disturb with the, the heat from the oven. And also it's very easy to work with, okay? There are certain steps in the fabrication of a refractory model because the refractory model has to be conditioned before applying the porcelain um, for, you know, baking. Another system that it's used currently uh, is the IPA, uh, IPS Empress system. Um, and this is uh, uh, done by the um, Ivoclar Vivian Company. Um, they came out for, you know, a long time ago, they came out with this um, pressable system, which is very easy to work with and has very good results. And also this pressable system have different type of materials, right? So Empress was one of the materials that was used uh, for aesthetic purposes and also as a um, way to um, have a substructure or ceramic substructure. Um, <clears throat> so Empress, it's a lucid reinforced glass ceramic and it's manufactured and made into ingots uh, that they have different uh, shades and opacities. So when we're talking about opacity, we have, we're have we talking about how transparent that material is, how much light uh, can go through that material. So um, usually all ceramics materials, they're a little more opacious um, in their, you know, um, com composition. Um, and um, also now the manufacturers, they come out with different recipes for their um, uh, all ceramic materials that allows for more translucency. So we can find, you know, different type of uh, 
levels of opacity. So we have either uh, low translucency, um, high transparency, um, medium opacity, high opacity. So uh, selecting the shade and the opacity or translucency level of the uh, all ceramic material for the framework is very important. What I mean by that, let's say I have a patient and the doctor prepared a tooth for a molar restoration, a molar uh, crown. And <clears throat> the patient, it's uh, A2 shade, natural shade of the patient, it's A2. So I'm starting to uh, wax up the coping for, let's say, uh, press ceramic restoration. And I got to think about it. If the, the preparation itself, it's a little bit darker, sometimes the dentin, when the doctor preps the tooth and exposes the dentin, the dentin may be a darker color than the natural teeth, right? So I have to take an account. If I put a, a substructure, you know, ceramic, that it's more translucent, that color of the dentin being darker, it's going to show through the substructure. It's going to show through the, the coping. So I have to show to to use um, um, ceramic um, material that blacks a little bit of the tooth natural tooth color, the dentin color. So maybe I like to use uh, medium opacity, so it blacks that uh, dentin color. And then I can apply um, the layering porcelain A2, and that's going to match overall. When I finish the crown, it's going to match the natural teeth because the uh, color um, of the preparation, it's blocked by that um, opacious um, coping. Um, <clears throat> so um, Empress was a very nice and easy to work with and good results system. It's still in use today. The only difference between the Empress system and other systems that are available today is that Empress, it's, uh, as a material itself, it's pretty weak, it's pretty brittle. And it's very finicky when it comes with um, following exactly the manufacturer um, recommendation in terms of um, fabricating the restoration, okay? So, we had uh, Empress and Empress 2. Um, the Empress system, um, again, it comes in different shades to match the patient's um, natural dentition, but also we can use stain and glaze to um, give that characterization uh, of the patient's teeth, okay? So when we do a wax up for a pressable, and I want to mention here that um, Empress system and uh, Emax system, the Emax system is the pressable system that we're using in school. And they're very similar in terms of um, uh, the steps, <clears throat> the production steps, but in terms of the material, they're uh, very different in terms that uh, the Emax press system, um, the ingots are a little bit stronger. Uh, we have a larger variety of shades and opacities with the, the Emax. And um, also we can use Emax to do um, monolithic type of restorations, or we can use them as to you know, design and fabricate a substructure and then uh, layering uh, porcelain. Um, when we're talking about monolithic, we're talking about that we can do a full wax up and press the material to have a full crown made from one ingot. Uh, when we're talking about coping, we can do a coping, press up the coping, um, have it in all ceramics, and then we can use a layering porcelain developed by the company to match and be compatible 
with the ceramic system to uh, finish the, the crown or the restoration. So for the wax up, the crown, um, um, we can do the full contour, like I said, uh, but also we have to think about it. If we do a coping, what are the requirements in terms of the thickness of the material, right? So when we do a porcelain fused metal, usually the coping um, should be 0.5 millimeters thick. So this allows for enough room to apply the opaque porcelain, the dentin porcelain, the incisor porcelain. So we have a nice layering matching the natural uh, shade of the patient. The same uh, concept applies to all ceramics. The only difference is that the thickness of the coping differs from all ceramic type of restoration to PFM type of restoration. So for all ceramics, the thickness of the coping has to be a little bit bigger. So usually it's about 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 millimeter thick. So also the doctor has to take an account when they do the preparation, if they have enough room for the type of um, all ceramic restoration that they desire. So sometimes they might need to prep a little more if we need to, if they want to use uh, all ceramic restoration um, for insertion. Um, another idea that it's um, more and more used today to kind of give the restoration a little more strength, but also uh, keep the aesthetic at high value is to use what's called the cutback technique. So in this case, uh, what we do, we wax up a full contour crown, and then we can cut back the wax on the facing, and then uh, we press the material, and then uh, we apply porcelain only on the facing. So we have a layer of porcelain on the facing that it's more translucent and it's easy to match the natural uh, dentition. Okay. Spruing, very important. There are differences between how we sprue a porcelain fused to metal coping and how we sprue a coping for or a restoration for all ceramics. Also, the rings, right, that we use for investment, they're different. Okay, so when we in, uh, sprue for porcelain fused to metal, we attach the sprue on the thickest part of the coping, right? And we attach the sprue at a 45 degree angle. That's for porcelain fused to metal. Now, when we're talking about old ceramic, it's a different type of um, method. So for this method, we're gonna use also the sprue on the thickest part of the crown, but we're gonna use it at a 90 degree angle, straight, okay? That's very important because we're gonna see later during the, the pressing uh, phase when the material is pressed into the mold, if the sprue is angled, that may break the mold, okay? So it's important to keep this in mind. Um, the gauge of the sprue also differs depending on um, what type of um, um, preparation or if we do in a coping or a full contour, right? So that has to uh, be taken into account before uh, we sprue the restoration, what gauge we're using, okay? Um, attaching a single eight gauge sprue former, six to eight millimeter long to the incisor area of the anterior teeth or the non-critical cusp of the posterior teeth. Um, so again, another aspect that it's very important in both porcelain fused to metal and also all ceramic, when we attach the sprue, the sprue has to be smooth all around. So when we make that connection between the crown and the sprue, make sure that the wax is nice and smooth, there are no voids in there, um, and the surface, it's, um, it's pretty uh, free of any um, 
rough areas. Um, <clears throat> when we do the sprueing for um, pressable, it's very important to look at the way we, ha we have to use the ring. So for instance, when we're using the porcelain fused to metal, we have the base ring that we insert a little bit of wax or a button, and then inside we're going to insert the, the sprue wax pattern, right? Here, we don't have to use uh, base wax. So in the ring, there is a little hole on top of it. That hole has to be covered with a thin layer of wax, and then the sprue patterns can be attached to the ring. Um, another difference between um, porcelain fused to metal uh, investment and ring uh, placement of the wax patterns is that uh, for the porcelain fused to metal, the wax patterns, they have to be placed outside the heat zone into the ring. And for the all ceramics, the patterns have to be placed into the heat zone. So that's a major difference, OK? Um, <clears throat> very important also, again, we've been doing this uh, with the porcelain fused to metal. In order for us to know how much metal we need for the casting, we usually me measure the metal, right? We weight the wax um, patterns with the sprue. And then we multiply that by the density of the metal, which is given by the manufacturer. And then we'll find out how much metal we need for that casting to be complete. The same idea applies here. In, in order for us to know how many ingots, or if we need a larger ingot or a smaller ingot, then we have to measure the wax pattern with the sprue before attaching them to the ring. So usually for the Emax system, um, small ingots holds up to 0.7 grams of wax patterns. Uh, for a larger um, ingot, it's up to 1.4 grams of wax patterns, OK? If, let's say, uh, the, the pattern weighs very little. So we have like just one little small um, filling that we have to press, right? And it weighs very little, right? Then we have to add what's called a dummy into the, the ring. So when the, the uh, pressable um, system works, when the, the uh, press material is pressed into the mold, if it's too, too small of a cavity, I might break the mold because it's too much pressure and it's going to go all over the place. But if we cast, if we add a little dummy, all that pressure is going to be uh, redirected into the dummy so we have a nice pressed um, coping, OK? Investing. Um, investing is uh, a sensitive process because we have to be careful at the type of restoration that we do. So for instance, if we are doing full crowns or if we are doing um, fillings, a small inlay, right? Then the ratio between the special liquid and water, it's different because we want a little more retention. So the, the ratio between special liquid and uh, water, it actually what gives us the retention of the restoration, OK? Um, for the um, pressable system, each pressable system, they come with their own investment material. And they recommend it to use that type of uh, investment. Now, I know Ibocar Vividend for this system, their systems, they're using two types of investments. One, it's a regular investment that you 
you know, you mix your investment, you invest your ring, and uh, you wait for the ring, you know, set it on the bench, let it set. It's going to take a little bit longer to set. And then you can start putting in a cold burnout oven and raise the temperature and then finish the pressing um, process. Now, uh, another uh, aspect that we have to be careful with is uh, the fact that for um, the, the pressable system, also we have to be careful that um, the burnout temperature it's matching what the manufacturer is selling us so we cannot use for instance if i use 100 grams rings versus 200 grams ring for the 200 gram ring i need more soaking time in the oven okay for the burnout process so we have to be also aware of that um the heat rate is very important how uh, much we can raise the temperature in a burnout oven per minute. If the temperature is raising too fast, the investment may crack or may break. Okay. So the manufacturer is telling us, okay, you can raise the temperature one degree or three degrees every six minutes or so. So follow those manufacturer instructions because those are giving for us to uh, have the um, most um properties that we're looking for in the material so we talk about the fact that for uh, pressable uh, ceramics we can use the regular investment but also some of the systems they're using what's called a speed investment again for this type of investment they come up with their own ratio between the special liquid and water so follow those instructions. The difference for you know the speed investment is that the investment sets a little bit faster and it can be put in the oven when the uh, burnout oven when the oven is already hot. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> we can place the and I'm gonna move to the next slide so we can see a little more. Um, so once the investment is done and uh, the ring is placed in the burnout oven, usually the manufacturer is telling us, okay, you can keep this investment in the oven in the burnout stage for heat soak for 40 minutes or an hour. Also, depending on the type of investment we're using. If we're using the regular investment, it might be a little bit uh, longer. If we're using the speed investment, it might, the time, the heat soak time might be a little uh, shorter, okay? Um, but you see in this uh, slide here in picture A, uh, it's very important because the picture A shows that long, uh, thin um, piece that it's in the back, and that's the plunger. And also in the front, you see a little bit different, uh, darker color, that's the ingot. So for the Empress system, the Empress system required for the plunger and the ing ingot to be preheated in the burnout oven along with the, the ring, okay? For the system that we're using in school, for the Empress system, that's not necessary. So the the plunger and the ingot can be put in, in a hot um, ring without being uh, preheated first, okay? So once the, the ring, it's heat soak and it's strong enough, we can take it off from the burnout oven, then we're gonna use a tongue to pick up the ingot, place the ingot first into the ring, and then place the uh, plunger, okay? And then we place this in the pressable oven and we start the program. Luckily for us in school, we have the um, um, Ivoclar Vivident uh, pressable oven. So the programs are already <clears throat> uh, inserted into the oven. So select the <clears throat> 
program that it's needed for um, Emacs. And also, when you're going to look at the programs, the program is going to ask you what type of ingot you're using. You're using uh, high opacity, low translucency. What type of ring you're using? You're using the 100 grams or you're using the 200 grams? So you can see the difference between 100 grams and 200 grams in terms of uh, how long the process of pressing takes place, OK? So for a 200 grams ring, the process, the pressing process takes a little longer, OK? So uh, we insert the ring with the ingot and the plunger into the pressable oven. We, play, uh, we select the program that we need. We press start, and the program start, stops, uh, starts. Uh, the, the program, once the program is finished, the um, oven is going to stop by itself. And then we can remove the ring from the oven and let it bench cool. Under no circumstances, the ring should be forced to be cooled, either by apply air or put it in a, a water or put it in an area where it's cold because the material inside, it's still hot. And this is glass-like material. So if we expose the ring to a cold temperature, the, um, the copings inside or the restorations inside, they, they, they might break, they might fracture, OK? When we're ready, when the ring is cool enough, we're ready to uh, divest. So we can use a clean um, plunger to mark the ring where we need to do a cut. So we take the plunger, we mark on the ring with a pencil where uh, the cut should be, and then we can use a desk or we can use a um, hand saw to cut that, the ring at that uh, juncture. And then we can use the um, um, sandblaster to remove the investment. Now, when we get to the sandblasting uh, procedure, um, we have to be careful. The closer we get to uh, the, the patterns, um, don't keep the sandblaster in one position because that might puncture uh, or it might create mi micro fractures into the copings. So uh, make sure you move it around. And uh, sometimes it's even recommended to go at a lower speed. So reduce the pressure in uh, the sandblasting unit. Um, so once we recover the patterns, now it's time for us to cut the patterns from the sprue. And for that, we can use a diamond disc. And then using different type of uh, stones or diamond disc, we can um remove the bulk from the the coping or the crown where the sprue was and reshape the um, um, anatomy or uh, the coping as needed um, the picture here shows us that we can use what's called um, a conditioner or um, a lining um, and that's that can be done for applying an uh, internal stain. But like I said today, the materials, they come in different shades that we can uh, match with the layering porcelain. So in many cases, this uh, lining uh, procedure, uh, it's not necessary. Um, so these are step by step <coughs> um, procedures. Uh, for doing the Emacs, uh, and it's exactly what uh, I described before. Just please keep in mind that uh, the only difference uh, in this uh, slide can be what type of investment you're using. Therefore, the burnout of temperature uh, might be a little bit different. Um, we're using uh, a different type of in investment. We're not using the Ivoclar Vivident Investment, we're using what's called a universal type of investment, which is uh, Bella Vest, uh, which has very good uh, results um, and it's very stable. 
So uh, please consult with the manufacturer instructions how to um, mix the ratio between the special liquid and water and also the burnout temperature for that investment. Uh, there are a lot of videos and links that I put in here that actually helps to visualize um, the whole process of um, uh, pressable ceramics. Um, also, pressable ceramics, uh, it's, it's very easy to work with, but we have a counterbalance also. We can use what's called uh, CAD CAM. Um, ceramics the, those are done using a computer assisted uh, design and computer assisted manufacturer so um, we're going to talk a little bit about that later on now when we decided for aesthetic purposes that we want to do a cutback technique uh, we have to be careful first of all we have to envision how the final restoration is going to look so first of all, we start with the full wax up. So we're going to wax up the crown or the bridge in this case to the full contour. And then, like I said, we can cut back the face, the facings. And if we look at this, this picture here, we can see that it's not only the face, facing that it's cut back, but also the incisal edges and a little bit on the lingual. And that gives a little more support for the layering porcelain and make the restoration more um, lifelike. Okay. We can use what's called a facial index. So we do the wax up, full wax up. Then we use lap body, take a lap body index of the full wax up. And then when we're ready to do the cutback, we can use that lock body to see how much we can cut, okay? Um, but this is used only for the wax um, cut back. When we start applying the porcelain, that uh, lock body ma matrix should not be used as a guide for the porcelain. First of all, the porcelain uh, shrinks about 10 to 15% when it's baked. So if you use the matrix and you do the layout out of the porcelain at the, uh, you know, the shape of the matrix, when you bake it, it's going to shrink. So it's going to be even going to need to add more porcelain. Um, so when we are doing a single crown cut back again, we will wax up to the full contour and then we cut back um, using either a um, carving instrument or like it says here a 25 number 25 blade on a scalpel um, very important sometimes you know uh, to make sure that the proximal contact the mesial and distal contact are um, um, free of wax so we can use that for the buildup okay um, and usually when we cut back we cut back about 1.5 millimeter of the wax so that allows for building up enough porcelain to create that depth and aesthetic as the natural tooth um, so from, from time to time, when we do a cutback, we have to be careful and we have to be aware of the thickness of the surface that we cut back on. So use a wax caliber to measure the thickness. Sometimes, let's say I have a um, 1.5 millimeter uh, clearance for, for the crown. So both the coping and the porcelain on top all together should be that's all I have 1.5 millimeter and now if I start cutting the wax to get to 1.5 millimeter I'm going to cut back into that substructure right also we have to think about it that each coping depending I said like the, the material that we use for each coping has a required thickness 
So for instance, if I'm using Emacs and the Emacs thickness is 0 0.6, right? I'm not gonna cut back 1.5 having that coping, the thickness of the coping 0.3 because that's gonna weaken the restoration, okay? Yeah. So we have to be very careful with this. Um, in terms of the surfaces, <clears throat> when we do the cutback, we have to be careful that all the surfaces are smooth and no sharp edges, all right? Porcelain breaks where the emits a sharp edge in the coping, so we have to be careful, right? Uh, sometimes the doctor, uh, or for us, will be easy to add a little um, nap on the lingual uh, color, just something to hold in the crown when we, we do the layer of porcelain. Um, this is mostly done for PFM. It can also be done for all ceramics, but very important when we finish the restoration, that little uh, knob has to be cut off and you know um, the surface has to be polished. So <clears throat> this is the cutback technique in pictures. We can always go back and measure the thickness of the wax. The design of the coping, it's up to us, but we have to think about it uh, in terms of the margin and in terms of the surface to be nice and smooth, round surfaces, round edges, and also apply enough um, cutback so we have enough room for the layering porcelain. Uh, now, I said before that we can do the same uh, type of restoration using a CAD CAM system. Uh, there are different system, CAD CAM system uh, out there. Most used uh, are the tree shape and exocad. There are other systems there. Each system, they're very similar with each other, uh, but each system, they have their own components. So when we using a system, we have to learn all their components and how they work uh, properly. Follow, again, the manufacturer instructions, even for the software, okay? So what the CAD CAM entails, so what we need, we need a computer, uh, the software, obviously, an internet connection in a browser, a scanner, uh, or uh, and a milling unit, or, you know, a, a 3D printer. Now, um, there are different types of, um, combinations that uh, in terms of the hardware systems, okay? Um, in terms of the scanner, sometimes we can use what's called a lab scanner or a desktop scanner. But more recently, uh, the those uh, digital companies, they came up with the intraoral scanner that the doctor can use to take an impression of the patient's mouth. And they take pictures of you know the preparation and the gums and the existing dentition and those pictures are collected in a patient's file and they can send that file into our system and then we don't need to scan because the scans are already done for us so we just go into the design and uh, manufacturing mode so <clears throat> Like I said before, we can we have different software. So we have the software for design, and the software for design comes also in different types of um, applications. So we have software applications for provisional restoration, for implants, for dentures, for fixed prosthetics, for uh, appliances like my guards and so forth. So we have to make sure that we're using the correct application of the software, all right? Um, any other additional manufacturing um, equipment that we're using in this process, each of them, they have their own uh, software. So the sintering oven, the 3D printer, the milling unit, each of them, they have uh, a software. 
uh, in order for us to have a nice workflow, we have to find the software for the manufacturing that is compatible with the software for the design. So that's very important. If there is any gap in between transferring information from the design phase into the manufacturing, some of the data in the patient's file can be deleted or ignored. Therefore, when it goes into the manufacturer, there might be some aspects missing into, uh, you know, the, the way the crown is uh, milled, okay? So that's something to be aware of. Um, so <clears throat> what are some of the materials that we're using as uh, dental ceramics? Uh, usually they are non-metallic in, inorganic substructures, structures primarily containing compounds of oxygen with one or more metallic or semi-metallic elements such as aluminum, borum, calcium, cerium, lithium, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, silicon, sodium, sodium titanium, and zirconium. Um, glass ceramics are partially crystallized glasses and um, they are kind of made to um, enhance the growth of the crystal in the glass matrix phase, okay? Uh, dental ceramics are formed in through prosthetic shapes or, you know, restorations, and um, there are different processes, including the sintering, casting, uh, pressing, copy milling, and CAD CAM machining. So those are the manufacturing processes, and each system, like I said, uh, has their own um, materials and their own parameters, okay? Um, what are some of the applications of ceramics in dentistry? Uh, it's usually to produce fixed dental prosthesis. Uh, zirconia can be used, uh, zirconia it's a very versatile material as a dental material uh, because it can be used as um, um, you know, for um, root canal, also can be used in um, uh, implants. Uh, zirconia is a very biocompatible material. Uh, the gum likes the, um, the zirconia, kind of wraps around the zirconia. So, uh, plus it has, um, um, it's strong. It can be as strong as the metal, okay? Uh, it says here, because of its lack of translucency, zirconia is better suited for application in propping posterior teeth, but um, that was true a few years ago. Zirconia today, um, ma different manufacturers, they came up with a recipe with their formula, so we can have zirconia that it's more translucent. That's why I said that the zirconia can be, um, strong as the metal. So um, just like a little side note, right? If um, zirconia, it's more monolithic and it's stronger, it, it doesn't have that translucency that we're looking for. So that type of zirconia, it's very strong. It could be up to 1200 megapascal. But we have also zirconia that is very translucent, right? So that zirconia, in terms of the strength, it could be up to uh, 450 to 500 megapascal. So because of the uh, components uh, added to zirconia to make it more either op uh, opacious or um, translucent, that affects the strength of the material itself. But um, what I want you to understand is that today we have different uh, types of zirconia material that can be matched in terms of uh, the translucency or opacity. Um, <clears throat> lithia desilicate or glass ceramics, alumina, zirconia, uh, and zirconia are used exclusively for core structure of all the ceramics applications. Um, so the core structure, we're talking about the framework. It can be a coping, it can be a framework for a bridge, 
but like I said today, because of the advances in um, the dental materials, we can see that actually <clears throat> those materials can be used to do um, <clears throat> a full um, full crown or uh, full bridge because of their um, aesthetic properties. Um, so based on 1994 um, survey, metal ceramics crown and bridges were used for approximately 90% of all fixed restoration. Uh, recent development in ceramic products, we, uh, they have improved fracture resistance and also aesthetic and biocompatibility. Um, the um, Empress system, which is a lucid-based glass material, was kind of like the first system of pressable materials. Uh, but now we have the Emax system, which is a pressed um, manufacturing process. But the material that we use, it's a little bit stronger and have be better properties aesthetically, OK? Um, so these ceramics are available as glass, uh, as powders, uh, or as solid blocks, um, and can be machined through CAD CAM processes or hot press, either as coarse ceramics or as veneering ceramics. Um, like I said, for each system, again, we have to be careful with the layering porcelain, the build-up porcelain, to be compatible with the substructure that we're using. So if I use lucid um, base material, I have to use a, a build-up porcelain that's uh, compatible with the lucid material. Okay, I cannot use lithium desilicate uh, build up porcelain on lucid glass, okay? So they're not interchangeable. Um, Etria stabilize, stabilized the zirconia. So Etria actually, it's what's called a, a filler or a binder. So zirconia itself, it's more like uh, different particles, very small particles. And um, they are held together with this bonding agent, the Etria. Etria. So that's why when we're talking about uh, milling zirconia, um, zirconia it's milled uh, usually a quarter time size bigger than the way we designed the restoration. Because during the centering process where we put the zirconia in uh, oven to mature, right? That um, filler in the zirconia, the yttria filler, um, disappear. So um, the bonding of um, zirconia molecules takes place, particles take place during that sintering process. So when we take it out from the sintering oven, we're going to see that actually our crown shrank to the correct size. Right. Um, Zirconia has very good properties, like I said, in terms of uh, biocompatibility, strength, um, and also um, translucency. Um, <clears throat> again, we can use different type of um, um, restorations, right? We just have to be aware that um, the material requires a certain thickness, right? So if we do a milling, let's say I do a zirconia crown and the crown is very thin, right, in certain areas, then that might not work. So either I can talk to the doctor and tell them, you know, that could be a problem. Um, let's either call the patient and reprep the tooth or let's change the restoration instead of having, uh, you know, all ceramic, let's do a porcelain infused to metal. So those are the, 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 the things that we come in with our expe expertise, okay? Um, a ceramic veneer that is pressed on the metal, it's called a palm. 
so porcelain on metal 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 so like i said there are different type of substructures that we can use right so we can have um porcelain um pressed to metal porcelain pressed to zirconia so what we do we do the coping in metal or zirconia and then we go through the same fabrication process of um you know pressing but when we press the ingots in we're going to use an ingot that is compatible with the substructure so either with the uh, metal if it's metal substructure or with zirconia um <clears throat> In terms of um, uh, the criteria that uh, a dentist could be, uh, should take into account uh, when we're talking about aesthetics and clinical uh, failures, the dentist should uh, not consider all mm -hmm. ceramic crowns for patients with extreme bruxes where they bite down very hard or they have a malocclusion, okay? um also our experience as laboratory technician uh, has to come into account that you know we want to have those restorations done and to be uh last longing we don't want the patient to come back in a month or two months after the doctor inserted the restoration in the month say oh it broke now we have to redo the whole uh crown Okay, so usually there is an um, expected um, warranty, so to speak, for a restoration to last in the patient's mouth. Okay, um, in terms of um, aesthetics, we have to make sure that the materials that we're using, the porcelain, the substructures, material, allows for the adjacent teeth shade to blend in so it's not like oh i put a crown in the patient's mouth and when the patient smiles that crown pops out i can tell right away that it's fake so everything has to kind of in terms of the color in terms of the shape has to blend in to be in harmony um so in terms of the milling like we said, you know, Emacs also can be milled. Um, and uh, it's also in that green stage. And then we can put it into the oven to be um, matured or vitrified where it shrinks to, and also it shrinks and also gets the color that uh, is mm -hmm. supposed to match for the natural dentition. Um, those are some of the uh, key terms that we use, uh, and those are from Philips Science of Dental Material. So when we're talking about core ceramics, uh, we're talking about the substructure, what we're going to use for the layering porcelain. When we're talking about dental ceramics, it's a specially formulated ceramics material that exhibits adequate strength, durability, and color that it's used in the patient's mouth to restore anatomic forms and function, and of course, aesthetics. Uh, ceramics products are used primarily for crowns and bridges that includes alumina, ceria, stabilized zirconia, glass infiltrated alumina, glass infiltrated magnesium alumina spindle, glass infiltrated alumina zirconia, lithium desilicate glass ceramic, each we have stabilized zirconia and various glasses and glazes. Fixed dental prosthesis, we know that that can include from a knee to a bridge. Um, and uh, fixed partial dentures, it's a bridge that replaces one or more missing teeth. Glass ceramics is a ceramics that is formed to shape the glassy state and substantially heat treated to partially or complete uh crystallize the object um also glass ceramics uh, are used in cat cam processes glass infiltrated ceramics uh, they have a crystalline uh, core 
that it's interconnected poor network. It's infiltrating during the heating by a capillary inflow of a low viscosity, high wetting glass. So these are the process how the uh, the um, ceramics are mature during the heating process and vitrification. Alumina magnesia, alumina spinel, or alumina zirconia core ceramics can be used for this process. Uh, we saw that alumina structure core, uh, it also can be used for different uh, type of uh, fixed restoration, such as crown and bridge. Um, CAD CAM ceramics uh, are partially or fully center ceramics blanks that are either milled uh, to the design that we uh, did in uh, using the digital um, process. Uh, castable ceramics, it's a glass specially formulated to be cast into the mold and converted by heating into a glass ceramic as a core coping framework or ceramic prosthesis. Uh, so castable ceramics, think about it more like uh, the same process as porcelain fused to metal, but instead of metal, we're using ceramics. Um, ceramic frites are power ceramic material fired in a dental lab to produce a dental porcelain veneer of a core. Frites might be glass, so mixture of glass and crystalline particles, which commonly contain uh, inorganic pigments. Ceramic glaze, those are um, either can be powder or more recently now they have a uh, paste that can uh, be applied on the surface of the uh, restoration as the last step of firing to give that nice glossy shiny look of the restoration. Okay, Ceramic pressable, hot press ceramic, this is what we've been talking about the whole presentation. Uh, also, in terms of the stains, so ceramic, um, they, we can use different stains that apply only for ceramic porcelains. So uh, that stains that can be used if we use a monolithic uh, type of restoration, or there are stains that are used only when we use uh, um, substructure ceramic core and build up porcelain. Uh, copy milling is the process of cutting or grinding a uh, substructure and using a device. So it's pretty much the whole process of CAD CAMing. So we design in the software, using a software, we design a crown, and then we send uh, that information to the milling unit, which using a software to um, mill the design crown that we did. Sintering is the process of heating closely packed particles below their melting temperature to promote atomic diffusion across particle boundaries and disinfectations of the mass. So in other words, to mature or to bake the porcelain. Um, another important um, <clears throat> definition here is the thermal compatibility is the ability of the veneering ceramics in metal ceramic or ceramic ceramic structure to contract in the manner similar to that of the core of the material. So in other words, the uh, layering porcelain and the substructure, it either could be metal or, or ceramics. They have to have the same uh, expansion coefficient or contraction coefficient. If let's say when the 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 best example I can give you, when the metal uh, we we did a bake, we have the uh, metal framework, we apply the porcelain, and now um, it's coming out from the baking from the oven, right? So we let it cool before we take it out from the oven. If the metal cools, let's say, faster than the porcelain that transfer into the porcelain and the porcelain is going to break it's going to fracture so those two materials the core material and the layering material they have to be compatible in terms of the heat how they cool off or how they they heat up okay that's very important 
All right, uh, more videos uh, for you to watch. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you.